If you're watching this video right now, you're probably working on your Econ IA, okay? So and you should definitely pay very, very close attention to this video and to what you're about to hear because I'm going to teach you a system for async evaluation for IB economics. And this method for async evaluation can be used for your IA. It can also be used for your IB exams, okay? So for your IA, you know it is out of 40 marks. Four marks out of 40 marks is for your evaluation. And um, if you can, if you can write a good conclusion, you can get a four out of four. But if you don't, you can, you might as well get two out of four or one out of four. And for your paper one and paper two, you know, in paper one, the evaluation questions are worth fifteen marks, right? A lot of students say that it's very difficult to get more than eleven or more than ten, right? But if you know how to write a great conclusion and you have the right arguments, you can. It is easy for that you can get four, thirteen or fourteen. Okay, and for paper two as well, um, there's evaluation questions. It, if you can write a good conclusion, that is that is what separates you from a level five to a level seven. So this video is focused on teaching you how to write a great conclusion. But if you want to learn how to write a good IA, you can go to search Econ IA on YouTube and you can find my videos. Okay, um, they have been watched by more than hundred thousand students, right? But if you have already watched those videos and you just want to learn how to write a conclusion, then pay close attention to this video. So let's get straight to it. I believe there are four ways that you can write conclusions, all right? And there are four sentence structures that you can use in your conclusion. You can use all, all of them, or you can use a few of them, or you can only use one of them. It's also okay, let's get straight to it, okay? The first way you can conclude is by saying to a certain extent, right? Um, so let me give you an example. So you know, for my, let's, so for, for microeconomics, I taught you that you, sh you can talk about indirect tax for cigarettes, right? So let's use that as an example. If you're talking about indirect tax for cigarettes, I don't know what your article is, probably, you definitely should refer back to your article but for example just to give you an example you can say to a certain extent using indirect tax on cigarettes is effective in reducing smoking because um, it is going to be more effective for young people because they have a high PED as they are not addicted right you know that young people they are not addicted to cigarettes they have a higher price elasticity of demand so when the indirect tax is imposed and the price increases there is a greater decrease in quantity of demand amongst young smokers, right? But on the other hand, for addicted smokers, for longer term smokers, they have a lower PED because they have, they are addicted to cigarettes. Therefore, it is indirect tax is less effective for the addicted smokers, right? So to re, so let me repeat, so you can just say to a certain extent, indirect tax is effective. It is more effective to young smokers because um, they are not addicted and have a high PED but they are less effective for addicted smokers, right? So you can see to a certain extent, you're saying, okay, it is useful to a certain extent. There are strengths and weaknesses. The second sense, uh, way you can conclude is by saying, talking about short run and long run. So, okay, so to give you an example, you can say, in the short run, indirect tax for cigarettes tends to be less effective, right? Because the PED is lower in the short run. And, but in the long run, indirect tax is likely to be more effective because over the long run, consumers can find substitutes, right? And because they can find substitutes, the um, their, the PED will rise and there will be a larger falling quantity demand in the long run. And more importantly, uh, in the long run, uh, it is more effective, it is also more effective in the long run because um, as young, because indirect tax is effective towards young smokers, right? So because indirect tax is effective towards young smoker, we can expect a significant fall in smoking rates for the future generation. Hence, it's more effective in the long run. Make sense? Short run, not effective because of low PD. Long run, PD increases because consumers can find substitutes. And more importantly, because it is more effective on the young gen generation. That's why over the long term, we can expect a greater fall in smoking rates in the population. The next is the approach of benefit versus cost, right? So for example, you can say that the benefits outweigh the cost or the cost outweigh the benefits. And then you come up with a reason to back that up, okay? It's not that difficult. So for example, for indirect tax, you can say, the benefits outweigh the cost of using an indirect tax on cigarettes because cigarettes are being overconsumed, hence it leads to a welfare loss, right? Indirect tax can remove the welfare loss and is therefore, um, and will therefore benefit the society overall, right? Makes sense, right? So there's an overall benefit to the society, the benefits outweigh the cost because cigarettes is being overconsumed and there's a welfare loss. So if if there's an indirect tax, the welfare loss will be reduced, hence the benefit outweigh the cost, good? Next thing you could do in your conclusion is by saying it depends, right? So I guess for the indirect tax case, you should say it depends on the price elasticity of demand. 
right? So if the PED is low, then it is going to be less effective, it's high, then it's more effective. But one thing you want to take note of is normally for your eye, it depends. You shouldn't use the it depends one because in the eye, it will tell you, okay, the PED is low, right? Like they will give you statistics about the PED. Then you can't say it depends on the PED, it doesn't make sense. The PED is already given. But for paper one questions, if they ask you just an open ending question saying evaluate indirect tax, so you can say it depends on the PED. It makes a lot of sense, right? Okay, last one is the government should strike a balance between. Okay, so this. So basically the idea here is that, okay, for example, if you impose indirect tax, that can lead to unemployment, right? Um, so if it leads to unemployment, but on the other hand, there's less smoking, so there's a uh, improve in the health of the society, right? So you can say the government should strike a balance between um, protecting jobs and reducing smoking in the society, right? So if the indirect tax is too heavy, the cost of unemployment can outweigh the benefit from less smoking. So it's important to, you know, minimize the unemployment while um, reducing smoking as much as possible, right? This is what it means by strike balance, okay? So you can, you can basically use all of these together, right? But of course, uh, the examples I gave you just now is um, you shouldn't copy them directly. You should read your article and see which ones really work for you. Now, let me give you another example. Let's say you're writing a macro eye. A very common topic for macro eye is monetary policy, interest rates, okay? So let's say you're evaluating the use of interest rates to reduce inflation, interest rates to reduce inflation, okay? So you know interest rate, if you increase interest rate, a aggregate demand falls and the average price level falls. So you have less inflation, right? Let's say you're evaluating that. Okay, so what if you want to use to a certain extent, you can say something like this, to a certain extent, the interest rate can reduce inflation by reducing aggregate demand. However, so when you use to a certain extent, you should always use talk about however. However, um, you can say um, not all spending require borrowing, right? So uh, oftentimes, uh, consumers and firm spending may not be very responsive to the rate of, to the interest rate. Therefore, the interest rate may not be the aggregate demand may not be responsive to the changes in interest rate and the rise in interest rate may not be enough to bring down inflation. Make sense? So on one hand, it can it definitely has an effect on it, have a negative effect on AD, so it can reduce AD. But on the other hand, however, um, uh, however, the many spending do not require borrowing, so um, the responsiveness of aggregate demand on interest rates is are very often quite low. But in the long run, this one should be easy, right? So, you know, for monetary policy, there's a time lag, right? So you can say, for monetary policy, there's a time lag. So therefore, in the short run, there may not be an unnoticeable effect. But over the longer term, the effect will be more significant. So it's likely to be more effective over the long run, okay? So for benefit versus cost, okay. So if you're trying to use interest rates to reduce inflation, probably the cost of that, the benefit of that would clearly be less inflation the cost of that would be higher unemployment, right? So you, you really look, so, okay, so maybe in the article it will tell you that the economy is being overheated, okay? The inflation is very high but the, and the unemployment is very low. Then you can, def if that is the case, then you can say the benefit of um, using monetary policy outweigh the cost because right now inflation is the major concern. Unemployment rate is very low. So the government does not need to be concerned about unemployment yet. Right? On the other hand, if it tells you that inflation is high, but unemployment is also high, then maybe you can say that the cost of unemployment may outweigh the benefit of lowering inflation. Okay, So they should not use this contractionary monetary policy, they should use other policies instead. Okay, So, next one is it depends, right? So it depends, what you can say something like, it depends on the consumer and business confidence. Then. The effectiveness monitor of monetary policy depends on consumer and business confidence, right? Because if the business confidence is very high, then a higher interest rate will have very little negative effect on the aggregate demand. But if consumer confidence is low, they are already geared towards spending less. Then if you increase interest rate, it will be effective in bringing down the aggregate demand, right? So it depends on the consumer and business confidence, okay? And, and again, whenever you use, use it depends, then um, it is, it is better not to use this for your IA because they 
They already give you real facts. So you don't need to say it depends. But for paper one, you can definitely use it depends. Okay. Last, the government should strike a balance. This one is easy. So ultimately, you can say there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, right? When we use uh, monetary policy to reduce inflation, there is a trade-off with unemployment. As inflation falls, unemployment rises. It is important that the government strikes a balance between lowering inflation and lowering unemployment so that both macro objectives can be achieved, right? Good. So if you're working on trade, uh, trade IA, uh, as I mentioned, the topic that you should do is tariffs, right? I mentioned in the other IA video. Okay, so for tariff, I think the most, the two conclusion ways you can use is probably these two. The other ones, I find it kind of hard to use them. So let's say you talk about short run, long run. What you can say regarding the short run, long run is that in the short run, tariff can help to protect jobs, right? But in the long run, a tariff protectionism leads to a fall in efficiency, right? Why fall in efficiency? It leads to a fall in efficiency because there is less specialization according to comparative advantage, right? When the, so protectionism reduces trade. And because of the reduction in trade, there's less specialization co compared to, according to comparative advantage. So this reduces economic efficiency. This can reduce the overall output of the economy, right? Less specialization. So this can ultimately lead to more unemployment in the long run, perhaps, right? So, and then for benefit cost, I, I like to think that tariff, the cost almost always outweighs the benefits, right? So protectionism, the cost of protectionism outweighs the benefit of protectionism because um, in the long run, there's a loss in, loss in efficiency, and which leads to loss in economic growth, okay? But of course, in some extreme cases, you, it could be the case that the benefits outweigh cost because the local producers are suffering, right? So they should be protected from dumping, perhaps. Right, so it really depends. This is up to, up to you. Okay? So I hope that you found this video useful. If you found it useful, please share it with your friends. Uh, leave a comment. Okay? So these five approaches I taught you today, you can use it for paper one, paper two, and your IA as well.